Hey there gang, we have a 1968 Guild X-175 Manhattan. For whatever reason, I guess maybe there wasn't a dealer back in the day, I don't run into very many vintage Guild electrics in this area hereabouts. Uh, this one has a number of issues going on with it. Primarily, the owner would like me to figure out this bridge for him. Um, it's floating, it doesn't fit the top very well, so it tends to wiggle around and slide out of position. So he'd like that pinned in place. And then there's this handy adaptive feature. Oh man. I guess someone wanted to work on the electronics at some point and decided that dealing with the F-holes and through the pickup cavities was just too much to ask. So they went and cut some big holes in it. I think they were really wishing this was a Gretsch because it was fitted with one of those big circular leatherette electronics cavity covers that you find on Gretsch's. Um, it's been drilled out for the holes. We'll probably end up plugging those. To be honest, the owner actually doesn't mind this. Um, he just switched out the pots himself and found that very easy. So we're not going to try and fill this in somehow, but we are going to make some cover plates that will be hopefully less of an eyesore. There are a few areas around the body where it seems like the top layer of the lamination this is all plywood, right? It has come loose. The glue can dry out over time and let go. So we're going to see if we can get some fresh glue in there, get these places locked down. The headstock face veneer is cupping away from the wood in a few areas as well. So we'll put that on the list. Looking at the bridge, we can see that this has been lowered before. The ends have been thinned away by sanding, so they're basically knife edges. And the other part of the foot that goes underneath the bridge has been thinned basically to the point where it's a veneer. And the fit between bridge and soundboard is not great. It's also leaning forward in such a way that it wants to rock back and forth when you push down the Bigsby, which isn't great for tuning. So after some consideration, I think I'm going to make a new base and we'll pin that to the body. In terms of action, we're a little high, around 6 64ths on the base, about 5 on the treble. And there are limits to how low we can make a bridge with the Bigsby tailpiece, because it holds the strings at a fixed height above the body. If the uh, bridge gets too low, there's insufficient downward pressure on it, and then you get the buzzes. At which point, the only remedy really is a neck reset. The relief is a bit much. We're around 16 thousandths, so we should tighten the rod a smidge and see if we can straighten the neck out a bit. That might also lower the action slightly. This has got one of those really diminutive truss rod nuts. It's a quarter inch. Give that a little snug. Yeah, it feels kind of loose. That seems better. We're down to around 8 thousandths at the sixth fret now. I think this has had a new bone nut installed at some point. You can see the pencil line on the front edge of the nut. In terms of string height, it's okay. The G and the B are a little tall. We can uh, lower that and also dress out some of this fret munch. Let's take off the tuners. I've got a little thing now that keeps them all in the right order. A lot of this headstock facing is loose. It's a plastic material bonded to thick wood veneer, so I'll clean out the mating surfaces as best as possible and then get a bunch of glue in there. And I'll get things clamped together between my rigid phenolic boards with um, some cork there as well. Because I'm doing an awkward joint over the volute, and so it's not flat on the back there, and I want to do my best to try and not to crush it. I did end up losing some finish on the back, which happens when you're pressing against old lacquer. Had to do some touch-up work. Then I'll turn my attention to the back and try to get off some of the sticky tape residue from former attempts to cover the cavities. Someone commented recently saying they'd heard Ronsonol lighter fluid might have changed formulas and that it isn't good for cleaning anymore. That hasn't been my experience. I bought my current bottle in June, and it seems like it's the same as it ever was. I'll make some covers using black ABS pickguard material, which is flexible enough to bend into the complex curves of the arched back, but rigid enough to stand up. Here I'm doing a tracing to figure out what shape might work best. 
I like to make the corners true radii because it's satisfying visually, it makes sense. And then I can use flexible drawing curves to join things up and make a shape that is reminiscent to a coffee table from the 1950s. What they call that? Googie design. To make the new bridge base, I'll need to take some careful measurements. I want it to be pretty similar to the original dimensions. You can see that about a sixteenth of an inch has been taken off the base here. I'm not going to try and duplicate this style of foot. So I found a piece of rosewood that looks promising. You've got to save these little scraps where the grain runs in funny directions because you never know. You might get just what you need out of it. And I'll rough plane things to the general size and shape. I'm using spray adhesive to affix my templates to some plywood. I've decided to make full-size routing templates for these covers. Now that might seem like a lot of work for a one-off job like this, but I have reasons for it. First of all, it's just good practice. And these covers will mount to the surface of the back, which is it's easy. It could be almost any shape. But in most cases, you're making something that has to fit really cleanly into a recess routed in the body. This is pretty much the only way to do that. Secondly, it's actually easier for me to sand the plywood to shape than the plastic. The pickguard material kind of gets fuzzy on the corners and it gets really rough on the surface. And um, I know that I can sand the plywood to a nice, clean, fair line and it'll look good. So after I got them to shape, I'll trace around them and I'll cut the uh, pickguard material out to a slight overage. You can see that it's about maybe an eighth of an inch excess on either side. Then I'll super glue that to the template. Then I'll act like a human clamp for a few seconds. Spray accelerator for super glue seems to be in short supply everywhere right now. Now I'm getting really serious about planning to dimension measuring things often. I'm checking the spacing for the posts. I actually did that on both sides in the event that they were drilled funny or something. You'd be surprised. And I'm laying out the hole locations. In this bridge the saddle part is actually at an angle where the base is perpendicular to the center line of the top. It's the kind of thing you have to look out for. With the holes drilled I'm adding some thin super glue in there too to really harden it up. I'm routing the covers to shape using a little template following bit here and some dust collection that is not very efficient. This stuff gets everywhere. It's really annoying. And you can see that I've added a handle on top here as well just to keep my fingers out of the way. This makes it easier to work with. I'll take the bridge base outside and introduce it to the oscillating spindle sander to make the scoops on the ends. Don't worry, my fingers are far enough away. I need to put a bevel around the edges of these cover plates. I do that by scraping with a single edge razor blade. This is another operation that looks really dangerous and it could be if you're not used to it. I actually have a piece of cellophane tape over the exposed corner of the blade so it's less likely to do damage. So I'll line things up as best I can. The veneer in the area that had been cut through here was quite loose and unstable, so I'm injecting a lot of super glue into the end grain here to hold it all in place and lock it down. I decided to go ahead and fill all those old little screw holes in the back here with some dowels, flush cutting them, and I'll pare them down in line with the surface with a small chisel. I'm using some de-waxed orange shellac here because it's kind of in the same color family as the finish on the back currently and that will seal things up. I'll mark out the covers for some drill holes using a compass into which I've inserted a rather large drill bit to run against the side and register. Go ahead and drill those out on the drill press and use a countersink get the cover in the right location. You can see here what I was talking about, the back having a strange architecture that this thing has to bend down in two different directions. 
I've pre-drilled for the holes. I'm going to run the screws in and out to tap them. I have to be gentle because this plywood does kind of want to delaminate. So I'm also soaking those holes with super glue. Now you're less likely to catch your belt buckle in it. I'll try and hold down the worst of the side delamination. Where I could fit a syringe, I injected tight bond. Otherwise, I wicked in some super glue. Here I'm sanding the base of the bridge so it fits the arch and the top. This can take longer than you expect. I'll apply a little bit of tongue oil to bring up some sheen. The studs had a couple of layers of hockey tape wrapped around them, which I discarded as unnecessary as they fit nice and snug in the bridge. The surface of the nut had a lot of deep file scratches and wasn't really smooth and a little bit ill-refined, so I'll clean that up a bit. Paying attention to the corners, that's important. You don't want to feel something sharp there. I'll do some sanding. You can see that I've already done some polishing and recrowning of the frets in the lower positions. Now I'm using micro mesh. It's kind of a judgment call. How shiny do you really want it? Relieving the back edge of the nut. This helps when you're, you know, using a Bigsby. Nothing short of say a roller nut or roller bridge is really going to make a Bigsby run smoothly, but if you can get rid of any excess uh, nut material that's in the way. It can kind of smooth things up and keep it from getting caught. Now I'll restring this beast. It's always a fun thing. Doing a Bigsby tailpiece. I use the little wedge there to hold things in place while I get it through the other end of the tuner. Using the outside E-strings as a guide, I've got this thing exactly where I want it, so I'll mark that position out and I'm going to drill for some pins using a very small drill bit. And for the pins, I'm using actual pins, push pins. Get those nicely seated inside the bridge base. And I'll clip those off. Leave them long enough so that they go basically all the way through the top of the guitar. Once these things are in position, it's not going to move anywhere on us. I'll push that down to mark the position and then I can drill two pilot holes in the top to accept them. Then I can work on refining the intonation and I'll make sure that the nut slots are at the correct height. Quick note on technique here. Notice how I roll the bottom of the nut slot up to the front edge of the nut. It's not a straight line. These old saddles were very loose in their tracks. You could wiggle them back and forth about a 32nd of an inch and they were causing a lot of buzzing and sympathetic vibration. So what I'm doing here is stuffing some cotton that I pulled off the end of a q-tip into the area between the saddle and the side of the slot wall. This will hold them tight and also dampen any vibration that's going on much better than it was. There we go. Let's have a look at the finished back. I think that looks okay. Doesn't look terribly out of place. Might not be original but it functions alright. And here's the bridge base. It's doing well for itself. I can now lower the action to below a sixteenth of an inch. Seems good. Guitar's got a lot of vibe. I like it a lot. These pickups are interesting. They've got a warm, chimey sound. They're not like Gibson's or Rickenbacker's or Gretsch. They're their own thing. And here's a groovy looking logo straight out of the late 60s. Looks like it was hand lettered by a sign painter.